and collaboration. And so we're going to delve deeper into, into what it takes in order to collaborate towards um, the successful realization of concepts and ideas, furniture concepts and ideas, and bringing them to life in, um, in real 3D. So first off, I'm going to introduce our guests. And I'm going to start from the end over there. Um, we've got Adrian Hugo, who is the co-founder of Dr. and Mrs., um, one of the most awarded and celebrated furniture brands um, in, in South Africa, Johannesburg-based. And then we've got Anile Vezi. Anile was one of the top 10 finalists for the 2020 Nando's Hot Young Designer Talent Search, which, um, which, sought, which asked designers to create benches that would be appropriate for social distancing, as well as be able to be transformed into, into, in, into usable benches once you know, we've moved past, past this phase which is taking a little bit longer to move on from. <laughs> and then over here, we've got um, Tracy Lynch. Tracy Lynch is the creative director of the Nando's Design Program, as well as Cloutus A, um, which facilitates the Nando's Design Program and other, um, and other competitions around the design space. And then over here, we've got Katleho Chuma. And then Katleho is the winner of the 2020 Nando's Hot Young Designer um, competition. His bench, the, the, the Sango bench, was, uh, was brought to life in collaboration with Adrian and the two of them will share a little bit about that process and about how that, yeah, how that came together. So just to start off, I think let us start with Tracy. Tracy, in her work as the creative director of the Nando's Design Program, she's, she's initiated and overseen a lot of collaborations. And, um, and I just think just, just to share a little bit, Tracy, and just around these initiatives, why collaboration? Why not just say, okay, you've won, let's just go and produce it and that's done. Why do you constantly work around creating collaborative experiences between designers and manufacturers? Well, Mali, I think it's extremely important that the designs come to life as, as physical oh, objects. Physical my apologies. Just sorry, Nera. I think now my... My apologies, guys. Okay, there we go. No problem. Mm -hmm. So as part of the process, all 10 finalists have the opportunity to be mentored. And mm -hmm. as we've seen, the designs that come through as part of the Hot Young Designers competition, they're really exceptional. Um, they are beautifully rendered, and they, are, they tell stories about heritage. They share the most incredible potential. But... Because the Nando's world would like to see these pieces come to life in its physical form, we've mm -hmm. needed to find ways to make that happen. And because we've created opportunities um, with our um, partners, so for example, Dr. and Mrs. are very established designers, and they supply a lot of furniture pieces to the Nando's world. So in that way, we have... Um, an opportunity to reach out to them and see whether they would be interested in collaborating with an emerging designer. So we've really been privileged that Katlejo's winning bench was a design that Adrian believed he would be um, willing to bring to life through the, the, the manufacturing processes and, and contribute. Um, you know, it's extremely important for an established designer to understand how to bring a piece to life because the materials are important, the processes of manufacturing, the time constraints, the budgeting of the piece. So all of these things come into play. And emerging designers are on a journey to learn. And that's something that we, um, as part of the Nando's Hot Young Designer, we are really very much committed to being part of that process and finding creative ways to get that to happen. Fantastic, thank you. So guys, just quickly, um, say if you've got any questions, please, um, those who are watching um, online, please send through questions via Zoom. If you're watching via Facebook, pop, pop the questions through. And then in between, uh, in between the chats, I'll be checking out for your questions and then, yeah, and I'll, and I'll bring them up. And um, for our in real life guests, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be opening up for a Q&A towards the end of the chat. So please note any questions you have and then, yeah, and we'll, and we'll go into that. And so just to get started, actually, just to chat a little bit about the actual designs because 
having watched the process and having, you know, had several conversations with you and the pastor around the designs. So, you know, we've seen the designs from the initial design and, um, and the translation into the more um, marketable design. But before we go into that, just for, for, for people who don't know the Sangu bench, if you could chat a little bit about that design, what was the thinking behind the design, and to share a little bit about your, your background in terms of like your design background, because you do quite a lot of different things. And if you can chat about that and how that then informs what you eventually entered into the Nando's Hot Young Designer Competition. Okay, cool, cool. Um, my background is like I come from advertising. So yeah, I've been working in advertising for the last, I think, seven years now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in advertising, I work in like motion graphics and like uh, 3D. So when I, if you look at like the, the almost like the approach is the same. There's always a brief, you know, there's mm -hmm. always like a creative problem to be solved, whether we're doing it in advertising or we're doing it in like design. So when I saw the brief, I was just excited about that. I was like, okay, here's a challenge to like uh, confront and like, uh, you know, like potentially solve. So yeah, the, so I saw the invitation. I was like, okay, uh, what's the best way to solve this problem? You know, and then, yeah, uh, went and like uh, did my own research and then like looked into my own heritage, you know, uh, being strong on myself. I was like, okay, throughout history, what have we used, um, you know, as things to like separate or not necessarily the word separate but like to like as dividers you know because the whole idea was like how do we create space you know and then i looked at like uh, the traditional african grass mats and for me it's like that was exciting to like look at and like how it's been used like throughout history for various like uh, things you know and then i was like okay how do i take this idea of like a traditional african grass mat and like take that and bring it into like a, a design aesthetic, you know, and then, yeah, that's how we got to like the initial like design idea, you know, and then, yeah, after that, I think, yeah, that was like, okay, waiting now for the competition. <laughs> yeah. I'll ask you, Henry, if you can put that, that be bench back on the screen. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, yeah, once that was done, it's like waiting for results and then it's like announcements, it's like, okay, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then after that, you know, it's like okay, now it's like looking at this, it's like how do we take this and actually like bring it to life? Now? Yeah. You know, and then I think that's the beauty of like working with someone like Adria. You know, it's like yes. I can leverage like his years of knowledge, where whereas I'm still like coming off like fresh and green. You know, it's yes. like he's been around and like he's been like creating products for most of his life. You know, so it's like when I come through and it's like start talking with him, then we looking at the designs like okay, what's important in this? and then but how also how do we bring it to life yeah in, in fact actually just before we go into that because i want to ask you um, Adrian, a little bit more about about how how that process went of collaborating with a designer who hasn't manufactured before but actually before we go into that if you if anily you can tell us a little bit about your design is it what your concept that you entered for the um the initial concept you entered for for the nandos hot young designer competition so, uh, architect by profession so when the brief actually came out mm -hmm. for the benchmark competition last year, um, I was solely thinking architecture based. And I think if you come from my background, we try and solve problems. Mm -hmm. We don't really think about storytelling and everything of that sort. So when I started following up on like clouds and all the designers that are part of that program, I started looking into how they approach design and how that can influence me and my approach to the, the bench. So initially, I think I came around numerous numbers of concepts before my initial submission. So, and I was playing around with shapes and the shape that stood out the most was circular. And that for me kind of symbolized women, you know? And I was like, okay, how then do I move forward from this point onwards? And from there, I started thinking about relating it to myself and my culture and what I can draw from that. So when you look at my design, like the bases are cone in shape. And when I looked at that, I was like, okay, this kind of symbolizes the Zulu skirt. It's dwab. Yes. It's gek. And then the top portion of it, I was like, okay, this kind of symbolizes the hat. 
you know. So I was like, okay, then I can merge these two items and try and come up with something that is solid. And basically, that's how I came around it. And the color schemes as well, um, using the pink and the black, were also to symbolize the strength that women actually carry in our country. Yeah. So, and it was also within the month of August, which was Women's Month, which for me kind of was like, okay, this is a no-brainer for me. This tells a well-rounded story about what I envisioned and what I would like to sell as my story in the product. So basically that was my concept behind that actually resulted to Imbogoto, yeah. um, which is the actual name. I actually didn't get to what name it is, but it's called Imbogoto. And um, the, the saying that we often go by is that what's in Umfa is what's in Imbogoto. Yeah. You know, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. So basically I think that was what I was trying to sell through my design, it's just letting people know that women have strength and tell that story through my design. So basically, I was also happy to become a finalist. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy, really happy. Cool, fantastic. And in both the, both the made up designs, were part of an exhibition in, uh, in Cape Town, the Right Here, Right Now exhibition, also put together by Cloud with the support of Nando's. And, um, and, and yours was made together with Mpo, um, mm -hmm. Paul from, from, from the, Paul back here from the Urban Native. So, so just, uh, I just want to actually just ask you, Tracy, because you are behind a lot of those collaborations. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like, how do you partner one, a designer with a manufacturer? Mm -hmm. What is it that you see that you think, why, why did you go with um, the Urban Native for, for Anele? And why did you initiate the collaboration between Adrian and Gatlejo? So, I mean, there are quite a few things that come up when I start imagining or looking at the pieces and thinking about what could potentially make a great collaboration. I mean, one of the things is aesthetics. You know, I look at the materials that are being portrayed in the images. With Catlejo, there were some hand-painted. I looked at the monolithic shapes of the piece that Catlejo presented and um, Dr. and Mrs. are very well known for their extraordinary architectural shapes and converting these amazing architectural shapes into furniture pieces. So there was an aesthetic connection that I thought may resonate in the, potentially in the manufacturing of the piece. So, so that was with Katlejo and with Anele's piece, um, Mpo is also very focused on sharing the stories of women, of South African women. So I loved the fact that there was already this beautiful connection there. And the shapes that Anele was using, there was a strong connection with some of the shapes that Mpo had, had um, in some of the pieces of furniture that she produces. So, I mean, there, you know, there are a lot of things that go into successful collaboration. I mean, there's also, there has to be um, a connection between the people that are collaborating in order for it to really stand the test of time and evolve into something more than just one piece. Mm -hmm. So when you embark on this journey, I mean, I, I look for those connections, but then it really unfolds. And um, in, in these instances, I think there was so much learning. And I think there was a lot of wonderful respect, which is extremely important in the process of collaboration. And I think there was also the willingness for the emerging designers and the real desire to learn from the really iconic established designers. And I think everybody recognized the opportunity. And in that, um, I think we, you know, we're very excited at the results and, um, and really hope that, that this is an option for future to keep yeah. on producing these pieces because we've done this in the past. Tabisa and Jo actually back in the day worked with Anatomy to bring some of her lights when she was um, the winner of the competition. And it has been amazing for the building of the design community. And then designers go on and they find their own way. But that first initial experience, I mean, Katlejo, you, you felt the same. And Anela, when you see that physical piece, when it's come to life, mm. 
it's just extraordinary from the render and conceiving of it and making the connections with the story and then the physical manifestation and to have people come and you know experience this expression this physical expression and sit on it and interact with it i think therein kind of you know really sparks and hopefully it means that you'll be producing and designing and building a career <laughs> actually you, you know there's the there's sort of like the beautiful idea and philosophy around collaboration. But at the same time, I mean, it's a practical thing because yes. it's two, you know, it's two people and it's practical work. And, and, and Adrian, because I mean, besides the collaboration to bring um, to, to, to manufacture um, Katlejo's piece, you've also done a lot of collaborations over the years from different positions, whether you, you know, you as the designer and also as basically the manufacturer, just I imagine that you would have the most sort of like practical advice, not just for the designers going into a collaboration, but also for the manufacturers, and also not just for someone who is the sort of like emerging person or green as, um, as Gatlejo says, but also for the person who's super experienced on the other side, but wants to kind of like bring in some uh, you know, fresh blood, fresh talent, new ideas into their business, but just in a very, very practical level, like what makes a collaboration work and what should people be prepared to bring into a collaborative space on both sides or, or on all sides? Yeah, it's, 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 it's like a, a bit of a relationship, I think, that, that you're building. Um, I mean, I've, my, I've, Dr. Mrs. Is, a, is, a, is actually a, a collaboration between me and Katie, my partner. So that's actually how, it, how, how we started our company, you know, and, and and, and this might sound a bit crude, but it needs to be both parties need to be horny for each other. At, 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 uh, so, so, but what, it, what, what that means is that, that that willingness to want to get together and make something and, 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 and work together is very important from the beginning. That's, that's the, the start of thing. So, and and that, that's when, when you know, two people come together and you're like, um, okay, I, I bring this, you bring that. I want a bit of this and I, you want a bit of that. And then something happen, can happen, you know? Um, and, you know, I think that also, just generally speaking, collaborations can be one-sided. If, if it's one-sided, even if, it's, if it starts out great and it starts going one-sided, meaning that you're feeling, one partner feels that they're putting in too much effort, the other partner feels that they yeah, get not getting a fair deal, and that means creatively, um, business-wise, time, input, all different aspects. Those things need to be balanced, you know? And it's not, I don't think there's like a science or law. It's like a feeling that you have, ah, oh, someone's working too hard. And then it needs to be open communication saying, you know, I, I really think that you must be, get a dead, like hit the deadlines. We're not hitting deadlines. Or I, I think that you must push a bit further on that concept. Or, you know, I think go, as a manufacturer, maybe go explore more materials. I know, you know, that communication is important to, 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 to be there and to make the process Forward. Because as soon as someone pulls back in a collaboration, it, it stops going and it, and it kind of collapses. So that's the sort of generally speaking. You know, I think that that's that, that idea that as much as you put in, you get out. Yeah. And that's what, what collaborating, it's a great thing about it. Like it's one plus one equals three, you know? It's like it's that real, you know, it's, you put it together and it, 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 you get more than what you, what you put in, you know? Um, and... I think with, with us, with, with this Nando's collaboration, the nice thing was that, that we've been doing stuff for Nando's before, and you know, that, that, that shape already, already existed, and that gave us faith in the process that it's not just gonna go nowhere, we can actually spend some time, put effort into it, you know? And then when I saw the bench, you know, just the, the visual of it, I didn't even know the backstory of it, it resonated with me. I said, this is something that we can get behind from purely from an aesthetic design point of view. It's original. It kind of stands for what our brand stands for, you know, originality um, and, and trying to push boundaries at, at some level, you know. And, we, and that's why we said, you know what, we can get on board with this. Look, the design changed quite a lot through the process of working together, and that was a quite a nice learning process as well for us. Um, but that initial spark was there from us, from our side. And when I think that's also, Tracy, you saying you're putting the two parties together. I think you did a great job with you saw a little bit of Dr. Mrs. Estate in there, and we can take it on, but not 
not that someone's copying our aesthetic. It's almost like you can see that there's, they, the language talks to each other, and, but there's still enough originality that you can work together. Because I think that, that also when collaboration can go wrong is if someone's identity gets lost within that p partnership. You know? And it's important that, that you creatively are recognized or your business gets recognized or everybody's input gets recognized for what they are and what they're doing. You know? And, and we, I thought that if we get involved in this, we can give a, we, our input could be there, but um, as a certain plate, and Katlejo's input can also shine through, through the process. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of how we, we, we started out. And then from there it grew, and, and we learned a lot till, till we got to now, you know? What you're saying brings me to actually to my next question, because, you know, like you're saying, a lot of things obviously changed, especially in this case, because there was this, like, high concept, and then in, in making the bench, and especially in thinking of a space like Nando's, which is kind of like a, a high-traffic restaurant space, then I think that also informs some of the changes, if I'm correct, Tracy, you know that. And, and, and from that, as a designer who is, you know, in that process, as things change, so how is that for you in, t in terms of how do you basically, you, some, one can be precious sometimes, you can be like, because you've put that idea and it's a brilliant idea and it's one, and then as you make it and as you have to be more practical about it, a lot of things might have to change. Can you just chat a bit about that part of the process? If the, like how, yeah, and how is that for you in terms of having to change some things? And I think we've got both the images of the original as well as the images of the, uh, the image of the bench, if you're able to put them together there. And just to chat a little bit about, yeah, about that process and how you stop yourself from being too precious about things and understand why things have to change. Um, I think it goes back to like, we're solving a problem. You know, it's like, um, we present the first solution, you know, it's like, this is what I think like this should look like. Mm. And then it's like, cool. Okay, that's workable, right? And then we get into like the manufacturer and then we really like start take, like breaking down the concept, you know, and it's like, okay, as much as like this is cool, it's like it's a bit high end for what we're trying to put into like a high traffic like Nando's, you know. So you look at it, it's like, okay, what's important about this? <laughs> Or is the other one here? It's the other bench, um, Katlekos bench. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at it. It's like at the end of the day, it's like the product has where it's supposed to be going. You know, and it's like, uh, yeah, just willing to accept that. That okay, cool. We might have presented this idea, but how do we take this idea and like still keeping true to the identity of like the concept? But yeah. Cool. I can leverage his expertise, you know, it's like, okay, this is what I think, like, it should look like, but mm. with his expertise, like, what does he think, you yeah. know, it's like, I think it goes back to, like, what Tracy was saying, like, the beauty of it's like, the language is similar, yes. you know, but it's still, like, two people, like, collaborating to bring something to life, and I think, like, through that, then you start beginning to see, it's like, okay, one plus one does equal three, you know, it's like, yeah. it's not necessarily now just what I want to bring forth to the table, you know, it's like, cool, my concept is still, like, a, a great concept, but it's like at the end of the day, it's like we still have to produce this thing to go somewhere, yes. you know. And I think working with Adrian, like that's what the beauty of it's like we're producing this thing to go here, uh -huh. you know. Yes. And once we start like uh, going through that, it's like at the end of the day, it's like design is at the end of the day about function, yeah. you know. It's like if what we've designed cannot like function in like the intended space, yes. you know, then let's rework the idea and like see how best we can like come up with the solution. Okay, awesome. And actually, I want to ask the same question for you, Anneli, because also your bench as well, going from the initial Bogota bench and going into, into a more pared down bench. And what was that process like for you? And then just, yeah, in terms of letting go of some of the initial ideas and embracing, and embracing new ideas. Yes. So basically, Tracy approached me about working with um, Paul from the Urban Native. And I was extremely delighted about it because I'm already a f like a fan of like her work and aesthetically how she actually like approaches like all her designs. So initially, I think I didn't quite have anything to lose because at that point I felt as if let me allow myself to learn as as a new designer, as a person that's still looking forward to doing new things 
with new, would like with more people and so forth. So when the collaboration started, we had to tone down the initial design because when we went to get it quoted, it was a bit too high. So Tracy came back to me about kind of mocking up the design, making it a bit more simple, you know, which is a bit difficult for me. But when I first well, I started all over again redesigning, I came up to a basic design that I was not quite happy with. But I sent it to Paul, and I think about a week later, she came back with her design, which actually I was like made me like so blown away, and I was really happy. And then from that point onwards, then I was just like, no, this is the final. I don't see it working out any other way because most of the aesthetic appeal that I had initially was still represented within the design that we actually came up to. Uh, with the collaboration between me and Paul. So, and the details as well for me, from what she added that I didn't have, or what she took notice of, because I had to send her the file that I actually used to create the bench. And most of that, like a lot of people wouldn't notice it if you're looking at it as an image. But when the bench actually came out, the design for the bench when it came out, and I realized the engravings, of my, my, my business that I shared with my brother, I was extremely happy because I realized that I still have representation, even though it's not just me, but it's still bringing back into the whole idea of collaboration. Because wherever you see it, you can still see the markings that represent me and my brand, you know, and still represent Mpo from the Urban Native as well. Yeah. So I was I was really delighted with the outcome that we actually got to. Yeah, it's it's, it's um, it, it actually reminds me of something else. I think both of you because because you're so open to that process and uh, like you're saying you understand where it's going. It reminds me of a conversation actually that I that I had with Tracy I think a couple of months ago. We were talking specifically about how young designers can get um, their work out there. And I think you were specifically talking about how young designers can get their work in front of interior designers who might be working on projects. Mm. And one of the things that came up, and I think it really lines up with this idea of how to approach collaboration, were well, two things that came up in that conversation. Firstly, we were talking about the fear that people sometimes have about presenting their work to a potential collaborator. Yeah. Because people often have fears about, oh, what if my, what if my work gets stolen? And then... Um, I think that was the one thing. And then the other thing that we were talking about was people realizing how many potential collaborators there are mm. just within their community or with their, even within sort of like their network or, or whatever, just finding out. I just, I, I just wanted you to chat a little bit about that kind of thing. For someone who, who, who's a little bit precious, who's, who's scared about putting their work mm. out there, but then missing out on the opportunity to realize that work through collaboration, what would you say to someone who's a bit worried about that sort of thing? I mean, I, I really have this attitude of just go for it. Yeah. Um, I love listening to Anela and Katleho talk because it's so inspiring. And I think the way you've both jumped at the opportunity and you've stayed so positive, you've come from a place of this is going to benefit my career. This is something that's going to be interesting, exciting. I'm going to learn. Neither of you once said the word fear or I was worried a little bit or anything. It was really about like, wow, this is going to be interesting. Let's go for it. And I think when you as a designer, you notice other people in your field and you maybe are attracted, like Arjun was saying, there's got to be this energy and you may be attracted to an interior designer, an architect, somebody that may have the, an interest in your expression. Um, I'm often sent work by emerging designers, and I am always astounded at the quality of the work. I'm always astounded how brave emerging designers are to send work through, and I love it. And I don't think, and I think anybody, even if it is a person that's very busy, they may not respond to you immediately. But if they see something in it, they will reach out to you. So I think it really is one of those things of if you're passionate 
and you're a go-getter and you want to be in this industry, you have to hustle and you have to make the most of it. And building relationships, building connections, talking to people and finding your way in is really where it's at. Um, I think, like I said, don't be put off if the first door you knock on doesn't open. You have to keep going. And I think um, you only learn from those interactions, building confidence. What we've established here, it's all about communication. All of this is about communication. So in your design aesthetic, when you're presenting it as part of the Nando's Hot Young Designer, we ask as part of that specific format, we love the storytelling. It's not that all design is about storytelling, and we're not saying that it is, but it's been a wonderful way to access the Nando's world and the Nando's community and bring things to life. And it's worked beautifully, and I think it's a very special part of being South African for us to communicate in a language that talks of optimism and it talks of creativity and it talks of beauty. And we can do that, you know, through design. So I think um, for, for emerging creators to just find ways to connect with people, find ways to connect with their markets, and I think, you know, whatever way that is, go for it. Actually, just going to put you on the spot here. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, to young designers who are watching and who would like to get involved and mm. who would, you know, get in on the action, whether it is connecting through the different um, op uh, platforms, opportunities created by Nando specifically, mm -hmm. or if they decide, like you say, just to send you, like, would you, how, how can they do it? Can they just like pop I mean, you? are there all sorts of ways of even, like we were chatting and mm -hmm. I said, why not go and buy, a, you know, or have access to a design magazine and go mm -hmm. through the contacts. <laughs> you yeah. literally can find people that are of interest to you and mm. it's so easy to make contact by email. It's not invasive. You can send your work through, or you can introduce yourself and say, I am interested in what you do, and I'm hoping that you would like to see what I do, and, and then share and your website or share a piece of your portfolio. So I think, you know, there's only... We have to be resourceful. We have to find ways to connect. Mm. And I think that's, that's what's been really special about working within the design community. There has been an amazing um, energy and positive optimism around building the South African design industry and, and, giving oppo and, and creating opportunities for emerging designers. And I think, you know, if you're a designer out there and you want to find a way in, connect, connect with competitions, connect with interior architects, connect with interior designers. They are the ones that are going to get your work out there. Okay. Before <laughs> I continue on the questions, I actually, I, I've got a question here on, um, from Zoom from Patricia Freeman. Uh, I, think, I wonder if Patricia's in fashion. Because the question is, if the designers could choose someone in fashion to collaborate with, who would they choose and what piece of furniture would they create together? Okay, you start. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. Cool. I think right now it's like um, someone in fashion like that's really interesting is like Tepo Jeans. I think like that, yeah, it's like very interesting like what he's doing, like uh, the levels like he's been able to like push his brand. I think like, yeah, for us to collaborate with someone in like fashion, that would definitely be him and probably like make some lights. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I think it would be interesting to find ways to incorporate like the jeans material into like creating lights and like yeah like working with that aesthetic i think yeah that would be quite interesting and then Anele? for me i think it would be latuma uh from Matosa. Uh, i think because of mainly you know the the print um and then having it like on, on furniture pieces for me i think would really be like something that would be aesthetically pleasing and actually even push his brand to a place where now he's venturing into furniture. Yeah. As we've seen with other like fashion houses like your Louis Vuitton and so mm. forth, that they are exploring that. So I think for me, Makosa really like resonates with the ideas that I have like for an African brand, basically. Mm. Mm. So in, in furniture, it would be one of like 
the people I'd love to collaborate with. And actually leading on from Patricia's question, because you've done quite a lot of like cross-disciplinary collaborations with people that were not necessarily manufacturers and you've done art collaborations I think if my memory serves me correctly because I think like I, I seem to think of Kutsi <laughs> because that was the first time when I, uh, I got introduced to your product I think it was in 2010 or 20, uh, something with Kutsi can you just talk a little bit about the value of that of, of, of being able to collaborate with people that are not necessarily doing the same kind of thing you're doing and what that adds so I, I think it's got to do with you know, the point of view where you come from and and just sort of one step back, say, say established designer and a new designer. Like even those point of view, it's 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 very interesting because established designer, uh, new, sort of young designer, has got this optimism, new crazy ideas haven't really like been hit down by reality, you know. So that is something that you can bring to the party, and that's something that an established designer can actually uh, learn from again or, or or sort of feed from. And then the established designer knows how things actually get made. Knows more about price. Know more about like the nitty gritty about stuff and that can bring, you know, that's where the young designer can sort of feed off that again. So that's quite important also knowing what you bring to the party, you know, um, and everybody's got value from a, from a young designer to established designer, everybody's got their point of view. Same with say fashion and, and, and product design. So, on. you know, it's when to take Katie, Katie and I, Katie's a graphic designer you know, and, and when we started out, she had some of these crazy ideas that how are we going to make this? And, and I thought, I, like, I didn't even think about that because I was already a little bit like the boundaries were set because of my education and so on. So, so sometimes the fashion designer will bring some crazy ideas or some, why don't you put this pattern on this thing? I'm like, how are we going to do it? Okay. And then you start working around it. And that's when that it, it, um, it, it kind of grows more than, 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 than the sum of the parts. So I think that, that it's, the, it's what, you, what, you, what you get out of the um, the. the, the the other, the other, the party, and what, even if it's wild, crazy ideas, it actually it it it, it adds to the to the process, you know. And and sometimes, you know, when when we once did a, uh, and we kind of doing some collaboration with um with in Swaziland with with glass blowing, you know, we went in there not knowing anything about glass blowing, and I approached it from that point of view that okay, we're making this balloons and how it, and I I, I didn't look at it from this formal point of view, and I I I, I almost said. Let's try and make, like, celebrate the maltiness of this glass, and that created a new product that also that they haven't seen. They used to look at something like that and throw it away as a, as a, as a um, you know as a, as a reject or offcut or whatever. And we took that and made it into a product just because we were not so, you know, our eyes were quite open to everything, you know. And that I think that's when you know you work with people from different different um, kind of parts of the industry. And how how they, they they kind of come together, and they can also be even business people and designers collaborating. You know, because sometimes, like design is not always about a product. Design is also designing a business or a pro approach to a problem around funding and things like that. So, yeah, sometimes you know you go into a meeting and you feel a little bit out of depth when it comes to um, the business part of it. But your a way of of solving problems can also solve a problem. How to get the money for the project? You know, so I think that it, it's almost like knowing what you offer and, and, and you know, I wouldn't say be, be yeah, yeah, not, you, must, you, you must have confidence in it, not overly confident and not be brash, but say, this is what I think and this is what I think, you know, and I think when, when we worked on that bench, you had your ideas, you know, you said, this is what I want and I want this round thing. So I'm like, okay, what do you not want to lose? You said, I don't want to lose this and you step, stand, stood by that and I, and I respected that that is something that we needed to keep because if you lose that, you lose the design. So if you go in there and say, I want this, but I can, I, I, I can sort of give away a bit of that. You know, that, that conversation was, was good. And that idea of knowing a little bit what you want out of the process, you know, and then it, it kind of it, it happens well, and you know, it, it comes together quite nicely. That's fantastic. Thank you. So before I carry on, so my, 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 my Janet Jackson situation here keeps pulling out. <laughs> Does anyone have um, a question for us before I carry on? We're good? So I'll just carry on then. <laughs> so I, one thing that came through when I was um, when we had a, a, a conversation, like so, I got the chance to visit both um, Adrian and Katleko while they were putting together the bench. I think it was back in back in May. And I had a lot of questions as I normally do, <laughs> but one of the things you, that came out, and I think you, meant, you you touched on it a little bit earlier, but if we can just expand on it a bit more, just in terms of the lessons that come out for you 
as a young designer, and then how those affect your work going forward. If you can chat a little bit about that, lessons from that collaboration, and how then that has shaped how you approach your design going forward. Uh, I think it goes back to what I was saying. It's like when you're starting out, you know, it's like working with Adrian, it's like it's just the beauty that like I can leverage like his years of experience, like working with actual making like products, you know. So once we begin like like coming up with okay, this is the actual problem that we have here. Um, it's nice, like as he says, like he's experiencing like pricing of a product, you know. It's like um, how do we put these two things together? Whether it's steel like and wood, how are we connecting it together? You know, like from my perspective coming from like an advertising background you know for me it's like let's get the pictures you know it's like <laughs> you know uh but before we get to the pictures like we have to create this product you know and it's like you realize okay certain steel has certain prices certain wood has certain prices you know it's like and then like working with someone like Aju and like then he gets to teach you that it's like okay we can use this for this like these materials like can go best here you know it's like and i think that's the beauty of it you know because at the end of the day it's like I don't want to say it's like this is the best idea out there. Let's just create this, you know. But it's also coming back and say, it's like what you were saying. It's like it's going into an end. We have to realize, okay, how do we work around like those constraints, but still keep like the integrity of the idea together. And I think like that's the beauty of like working with someone like Arjun. Yeah. yeah. And I should actually just to pull it out a little bit and more look at it more generally around around South Africa. Um, Tracy, because you, you said before, especially with working together with the, with the Nando's design project, this, con this idea of, of, of building South African design, especially in the furniture and lighting design space, into, into a globally recognized category brand. And, and that in itself is built out of a lot of collaborations. Yep. Because it is an industry literally collaborating to basically... At a certain, in a certain way, transform a country or an industry within a country. Can you tell a little bit about that, that vision to take, to take South Africa, South African furniture and lighting design, and some of the recent collaborations that, that have led, that, you know, that sort of like lead a little bit more towards that? Yes, yeah, so um, I think I'm extremely passionate about South African creativity and what we have to offer. And I'm also very passionate about positive messaging. So we live in an extraordinary country and this, there is a lot to celebrate here. And when I look at the South African design scene and I look at the potential for job creation, the potential to bring dignity, the potential to say something different about who we are and what we're about, it, the, the design industry can do that. So we have definitely given ourselves a lofty goal. There's so many amazing um, organizations, businesses, people that are passionate about South African design. And what's been really inspiring is when we have taken South African design to the rest of the world, the response that we get. Unique, extraordinary, unlike anything else I've ever seen. Um, and all of that really gives all of us the inspiration to know that we're onto something really important here. So, I mean, it is about bringing emerging creatives into the space. We have to look for opportunities. We have to find ways to seduce business, to understand what this opportunity means. We've got a massive unemployment problem in South Africa. This is an industry that can really bring amazing opportunity for many people. So it's the making, it's the designing, it's the marketing, and then it's all that beautiful positive energy that needs to be shared within South Africa, but then also be noticed by the rest of the world. Uh -huh. So it is in that, and I think we are very passionate about looking at business opportunities, looking at manufacturing opportunities, being very focused on local and making sure 
that the Nando's design program draws in all these opportunities. Find the talent, get out there, create the opportunities, platforms, competitions, mentorship opportunities, and then circle it all back into sustainable business opportunities. So we have to speak the language of the creative, we have to speak the businessman's language, we have to speak the language of regeneration, and we have to speak heritage, and we, you know, designers have, have got to be, be able to wear all these caps. But I think that's one of the I think aspects of that is what excites us as well. And I think, um, you know, there, there's never a day that goes by that I'm not completely blown away by the beauty that I experience in this sector and the potential that it has to, to really do great things. So, yeah. I, actually, Leona, just, we've got about, we've got about um, six minutes left, and, and I really want to get into into this idea, especially because from, from your, when you're talking about heritage, but in, into this idea of storytelling, because, you know, even if, you, if you're looking at, I mean, if you're looking at design and, uh, at countries and, uh, and places that have like a, a design identity that is celebrated, often alongside the technique that we celebrate, we're celebrating a story and we start, w and, and people put things high up when they believe in the story and they believe the narrative that has been shared. Um, well, I write for a living, so I love stories. <laughs> so I like to believe the story is just like such a, such a super important thing. But I actually want to start with, um, with you, Anil, just to chat about like why, why the story was so important in your, um, in your design and how important was the, yeah, the storytelling. I think for me it was more so trying to like capture the moment because um, I tried to like put myself in a space where I really was trying to like think of a narrative behind my bench. But within that space, the only thing that was kind of clouding my space was the, the whole thing that was happening around the gender-based violence and women. So within that context, I was also trying to sort of frame the entire piece to have that narrative that can still relate to my culture, you know, but still also grab attention of someone else because I feel like I don't want to like kind of point out to one culture that only represents me, but I want every single person to find a piece of themselves within that piece. You know, even though most of the representation comes from the Zulu tradition. And I think that's where the story began for me. It, it was really centered around what was happening for me at that present moment. And giving off whatever that I had in my mind in that space and just saying, okay, this is my entry. I'm not sure what it's going to say to anyone else, but this is what I was believing in that moment. And this is what I hope it can kind of translate to anyone else who's looking at it, who's reacting to it, touching, feeling, because all those sensory elements have to tie in at the end of the day. So I think for me, that's where the story actually began. It is interesting because there's, um, I find, I mean, obviously not to sort of like uh, minimize it to just two kinds of designers, because there's times when one can look at inspiration from all over the world and be like, I love that, and want to kind of like have some of that, but also r reminding ourselves of the importance of our, of our own narratives, or, or as South African, like I mean, or the various South African narratives that are, which, which reminds me, because I remember often when, when they write about your brand, about Dr. and Mrs., Joburg is always a central, uh, people speak a lot of Joburg, I mean, not always, I mean, perhaps less so now, but there used to always be a lot around Johannesburg. If you can chat a little bit about then how, how you've combined the different techniques and also being able to make the, um, the, the design resonate almost like at a global sort of like aesthetic level while still being able to stay true and incorporate the story of Johannesburg into your design. So this, uh, this, this thing about storytelling and, and how it goes to design, it's something that I find sometimes quite difficult because it's, it's, it's like when you're in it, it's difficult to know what you're in. Someone from outside can, can almost tell a story better or, or look at it from a different way because I, I always feel that I think if you're, if you're coming from the right place, 
from creatively, if you're creating from from a place of originality, then that's your place, that's your home, that's your that's your surroundings, and that kind of comes through in in your work. Um, you know, because we I breathe Joburg, I live Joburg, I am in the space, and I manufacture within this kind of um, this landscape, and that comes out in the work if I want to or not, almost, you know? Look, we, we, you, you get different briefs, and uh, something needs to be, yeah, you know, like more office ready, and this is maybe for more like a, like a, like a collectible piece, whatever, and you can see where you played with, but it's still, your, your signature comes through there if you, if you make sure that you, that's what you do. You not go and copy something, you know, or you don't try and force a narrative, or you're trying to create something that you're not, and I was, the way I approach it, and maybe different ways, is for me just to be, true to what, who I am, you know? And that's where the Joburg narrative comes through. It's not like I wake up in the morning, I look, I want to be Joburg. I wake up in the morning, I, I, I drive around Joburg, and, and, and I use that as, as, I use the suppliers in Joburg. I stop at the traffic lights in Joburg. I, you know, I, I eat food in Joburg, like everything is here, and that's why I don't want to hide it. I don't want to be from Copenhagen or whatever. I'm from here, and I also, that's, my, that's what I tell the world. And sometimes, you know, We've also said like the modern African aesthetic is some of the work we do, and maybe that's also got to do with my education being taught in some of the European and Bauhaus and those things. And I can't take it out of me because it was in me from like where I was got educated. But now, if you look at other things and you also take that in, it you grow, you know, and also it it grows with you over time. I feel like my my I. Our identity and, and my identity has, has now moved to a space that I feel that I can almost be my own identity. Like, and, and, and I can I create stuff that I feel can be proud of, and, and it, I don't have to really force it into another box or another box. I'm the box now, and, and I'm okay with that. But it took time to get there. You know, we did a range a while ago that we called practically everywhere, and we did a lot of things around Joe, but that felt that was just felt too much, you know? And and that, that range, if, you, if I don't tell you the story, you might not know that it is Joburg, but you get that feeling of that craziness that I sometimes experience in Joburg just through the pieces. And then the narrative comes in and it makes sense. But I, and I think to, to your point that you, you also want it to be universal. You know, it's, it's, it, you're, 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 you want to connect with another culture or another person or not some, somehow. So, so I think that, and that comes by just being really true to yourself and not trying to push some, something that's not there. You know, I think that's how we got developed into being the Joe Book aesthetic, uh, if you want to call it that. But sometimes I don't know how we got there, but we got there by just making it and, and always, yeah, always being true to ourselves all the time, you know. Okay, just before we finish off, I've got one more question for you, Tristan. But first, I've got a question from, um, from Kirsty on Zoom. Um, how can, uh, for, for you, Tracy, how can a local designer access the international market? Wow, that's a big question. That is big. Yes. <laughs> I mean, accessing <laughs> the... I do... Yes, yeah. please. about that. Yes. The international market is huge. Choose what market you want to be first. But really narrow it down to that one interior decorator overseas you want to be with. Or, and like, I don't know, like it, it, the mm. idea of international, it's just too big. Yeah. You really know what you want to do and then zoom into that point. That's what, I just want to interrupt there, but I think that's, mm. you, that's a like good that, 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 that idea of international is just so big. You would jump into what pool? I don't know. Like, like Australia. I mean, even Australia. choosing an international design show is a mammoth task. You know, where do you go? To the UK, to Italy, to the States, to the Middle East? You know, you, it, it's massive. That question, how do you make that choice if you have the opportunity? So how do you make that choice whether you want to be like at a what, design day, whether Dubai or I think Milan you have to do your or, research mm -hmm. and then you also have to find opportunities to make it happen because it's massively expensive. You know, um, to, to get it right, there's massive investment. So I think p being part, when we, we've done a beautiful showcase with Tabisa and Joe and Urban Native, and it was, it was really special in Milan, um, but it, it took a lot of focused attention from Tabisa, the designing, the application, and then getting the funding, you know, that, that, that's massive. And then what are you wanting to achieve through that show? Do you want to bring a voice and eyes to South Africa? Do you want to have orders come through your business? You know, there, there, there are lots of things to consider. So do your research and don't underestimate the local market. Everybody, some, you know, there's a lot of glamour around being an international designer. 
but there's a lot of opportunity right here in South Africa. And I think if you can get things right here first in relation to your manufacturing and getting your market to understand what you're about, then you're much further down the line to making a success of an investment that would take you to uh, you know, a city like London or, or New York. Thank you very much. We're like literally a minute over time. Um, if I can just quickly check, I think I've got just like one more question. Um, this is also to everyone from Trish Freeman, to everyone, which is the most memorable place you have come across or the most memorable piece you have designed? <laughs> Comes to mind specifically in answer to that? Uh, I think, like, personally, it's like I've been looking at, like, a lot uh, at Adrian's work, you know, it's like, I think looking at, like, some of his scones lights, like, I think they're simple, but, like, yeah, it's like something so simple, but when you look at it, you're like, this is great design, you know, it's like it's something so simple, but, like, you can tell that there's a lot of thought that has been, like, that has gone into that. Mm. Apologies, guys. <laughs> just because we are completely out of time, I'm not going to let you answer that question. But, but if, if you can just give all your um, Instagram handles, if anyone wants to go and see your work or get a bit closer to it, go. What's your uh, Instagram handle? It's uh, at the number one and then one written out zero, O-N-E and then K-A-Y. So that's at one, one K. And Tracy? Nando's underscore H-Y-D. <laughs> <laughs> it's at Anne Okay. And then... And <laughs> 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 Mrs. And please go um, and check out the Nando's underscore HYD and also as well as um, Cloud SA, sorry, Cloud underscore SA Design to see some of the work that um, and the, the collaborations and work that Trace has been doing with various designers. And I think that's us. Thank you guys and thank you everyone. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 Uh, welcome back to the Basha Uhuru Creative Conference hosted at Constitution Hill. My name is Jean-Michel and we will be hosting the next set of talks which is a collaboration. So a part of this panel this evening is Lance McCormack who I consider as an OG in the music industry. Um, I don't know if you want to give yourself a little bit of an intro there. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's the music industry where I started was, we were just chatting about this earlier, extremely different from the music industry today. But one of the constant has been the importance of collaboration. And so that's something we're going to discuss today. But I started my career um, in the industry as an independent label. and. Uh, Cape Town working with independent artists, rock artists, hip hop artists back in the, in the early 90s. But sure. Is it cut? Cut. cut. Oh. Where are we supposed to be looking at? The wide, which is the one in the center. So apologies for, for those tuning in. There's some technical difficulties. <laughs> no problem. So round two to the uh, Basha Uhuru Creative Conference talks hosted at Constitution Hill. Um, as said tonight, the talk is going to be about collaboration and independence in the music industry. To my right, I've got two people I consider very highly in the music industry, Lance McCormack and Sepangra Moba, who um, Lance, 
if you don't mind giving us a bit of an introduction, I consider him an OG in the music industry. OG, thanks, uh, Jean Michel. Um, I have been in the music industry for a number of years. Started off in the early 90s uh, with an independent label in Cape Town. It graduated to working for almost two decades for a major record label um, and then got out of that business in about 2012 and went into the live music industry. And I'm currently now based at Constitution Hill and I'm the manager of what we, uh, the Flame Studios, which is a new project or a new space that we opened uh, beginning of this year. And yeah, I mean, for me, in all those years in the music industry, um, the one constant and something we're going to talk about tonight is the importance of collaboration and how you can collaborate. If you collaborate with the right people, the right brands, the right companies, the right management, you can advance your career significantly in the music industry. So I'm, I'm privileged to share the couch today with Tsepang, who is an extraordinary artist and musician and is fiercely independent, um, but also has got incredible insights in, in, in terms of the, the recording industry. And so I'm going to hand back to Jean-Michel, who's going to introduce my, my co-panelist tonight. Yes, the, as Lan said, the co-panelist is Tsepang Ramova, who I've admired as a fanboy. He is first and foremost the drummer of Blackjacks, I've seen, who I've seen many times. Also runs a studio based here at Constitution Hill called Post Post. So take it, take it away, my friend. Tell us a bit about yourself. Tsepang uh, Ramoba. Yeah, I'm a drama with the blackjacks, as you said. <laughs> and then I've been uh, doing a couple of uh, projects myself, like uh, uh, my solo album and my, s my blackjacks album. And uh, I also have a studio here, as you said. And I also used to run a label, a boutique label called Post Post. Uh, I had a couple of artists. I'm not doing that anymore. And I also, most importantly, I do music for film and commercials, uh, which is my main, my main thing at the moment since we've been, we haven't been performing. So I'm mainly an artist, so I'm, I'd like to talk about that more, uh, being an artist more than uh, the music business. So I guess on that note, the pandemic, which is ever present, has mm -hmm. forced artists to collaborate. As you say, you've been um, collaborating with, with different studios and production houses to create work. Explain a bit about that process, about how you find the right partners to work with and how to collaborate with them. Do they come to you? Do you go to them? What is that process like? I think... Uh, Sometimes uh, people come to you, but most importantly, like I, th I don't believe in like sitting down and waiting for people to, to, to come to me. So at the moment, I'm doing a collaboration with Lance as well. So there's an artist uh, from Soweto, a jazz artist that, like I've always asked him, like why doesn't he record his music? And one day. Uh, Lance told me to come check out Flame Studios, and then I went there, and then I was blown away. And I was, you know, we, talk, we spoke about collaborating on producing this uh, this artist uh, album, and you know, as Lance said, like uh, co collaboration is very important. Uh, we're gonna have a, a whole album of an artist, and he's gonna actually own his own masters. We're not gonna be like a, you know, like a, a normal record label where, yeah. So that's the most important part, and that's why collaboration is so uh, important because it's important to own your masters, and it's not easy as a an artist that doesn't have the facilities to record uh, to own their masters. It's very important. So I think on that, could you maybe give us some insight into being an independent artist? distributing music independently versus distributing music through a label, which is something that you've had insight into on both sides, working, like you said, with a major label and then also releasing music independently. 
how do you navigate the role of independence as an artist now? Yeah, well, you know, the industry, when I started um, in the early 90s, I, we were chatting about this earlier, um, you know, everybody, when you're starting out or you have, I mean, I'm not an artist, I'm not a, I can't play a note, I can't play the drums like this genius here, but, you know, so I, my passion was for music and I could express that through, you know, starting a label with artists that you love and they're your friends and so you start off on a very street level basis that was the, actually the name of the label and as you as you grow that that business you realize very quickly that you as an independent you you have all these you know great things going for you you can retain all your ownership of your recordings you don't get told what to do by the record company but you realize very quickly that you still need key elements that can be provided by a big record company. And those are things like manufacturing, distribution, marketing, publicity, promo, plugging radio. Those are things that you know are, are crucial to any artist and any small label that's trying to grow. So the world is, the music world is full of stories of independent artists that sign up, you know, labels that sign up amazing artists and they, you know, they go the whole indie route but inevitably they get snapped up by one of the big a Universal or a Sony or a Warner. Those are the three majors that are left in the, in the, in the current landscape. Um, but you know, the, the industry then you know, has evolved so dramatically with the advent of technology and the internet and streaming that it's, it's almost difficult to look back at those early days. But I think some of the, some of the principles still apply. I think you know, there's still a role for uh, the bigger record labels, they still provide all those services that and the manpower and the resources what they've got going for them is that the big labels have got financial you know, they've got deep pockets uh, and and streaming has only enhanced that you know, they have this incredible uh, catalog which obviously provides income which they then channel through to developing new artists or, or signing up artists that are inevitably would have come through an independent uh, route. But, you know, I got out of the sort of record label business after, after 20 years um, to try and explore different avenues. And those were, you know, live performance and um, working with brands and trying to learn more about the broader music industry, not just the recorded music industry and the label side. So, you know, inevitably, you know, you learn a lot along the way, but Again, I'll come back to it, you know, even if you're an independent artist or you signed to a major label, you have to collaborate. I mean, music was born, and popular music was born out of collaboration. It, it's, it's something that is absolutely critical to an artist's growth. So I've got many examples over the years of, of trying to develop and trying to foster collaboration. So it's not always easy to do that if it happens organically, and uh, Tsepan can talk about that some of the collaborations, you know, that they've done. Um, that, however it evolves or where it starts, and it's not, it's not easy to get right. Sometimes the chemistry is not going to work, but sometimes it pays off big time. And then you, you enhance the artist's career and the artist will grow. So that's, I hope that answers uh, in some way. But yeah, yeah, like, again, collaboration and, and is, is, it's the lifeblood of a large part of the industry. So it's not just collaboration between you know, different artists, but it's collaboration with brands or collaborating with somebody who's a very effective manager or somebody who's going to book you for tours. It's, it's, it's by, na by its very nature, it's a collaborative business. You have to I think build those relationships and maintain them. What, what, what is key as well, I th w something you touched on, is, is artists having to do the work. And I think, Tsepang, you can expand on when, when Blackjacks were starting, you guys were collaborating with people overseas, you went to the States to kind of tour, see what you could, could navigate that side and, and, and manifest that side. Could you give us some insight into, as an independent artist, when you headed through to the States for the first time, how you met people, collaborated, and, and how that opened up doors for the Blackjacks? Um. Like uh, what's what's exciting is that when we when we first went there we were still independent, and 
uh, we were hustling a lot. Like we were all doing the groundwork of like doing our own shows because we, we were never really booked. Uh, so we would do our own shows in like the whole of Joburg. We'd even go to the Northwest, like in the middle of nowhere, perform, look for uh, uh, like random venues to perform. And then when we got the, the, the opportunity to go to the States, we got to, to New York. And I remember thinking, I was reading an article, I don't remember the magazine, that Led Zeppelin uh, did a whole tour in the jet, like without a song on radio or a video on TV. And I found that like incredible. And when we got there, we performed at the uh, meat packing district at a really nice venue and it was the first time we performed at a venue like that uh, for Fader magazine and then after that after that um, uh, that show we, we we drove down to Texas and Texas we went to a festival where like there was like almost everybody like the bookers the record labels the radio stations the TV uh, people and the main thing of, an indep of being independent is communication. So you can't just go there and perform and leave. Like somebody has to talk. You know, there's somebody in the band that, that has to be the mouthpiece, you know. So I, I kind of spoke to almost every, I got a chance to speak to everybody. Like, you're a booker. Like, how does this happen? How does that happen? Uh, you know, can we do a couple of shows before we go back? We speak to a couple of radio stations. We ended up performing like at a couple of radio station um, showcases and TV showcases, and which was like incredible for us. Like we were still young then, and coming from South Africa, we didn't know much about anything. But that story of Ze Led Zeppelin like kind of kept me thinking of this can happen, you know. Um, when we went back to, to New York so that we can come back home, we decided let's, let's actually, the same hustle we pushed at home, let's actually try to push it here. And we found a couple of venues around New York and we performed at small venues. And then one day we were called by, um, there's a song that we recorded and put it on MySpace and uh, there's a Japanese uh, radio station that found the song and they was like, yo guys, can you uh, record another song for us? Uh, we'll pay for the studio. And then we ended up at uh, um, Electric Ladyland, Jimi Hendrix's uh, uh, studio. We got there and they gave us like three days, but because you know, we were so ambitious and we were young, Three days is not to record one song. We recorded the whole EP there. <laughs> we recorded the whole EP. And um, after that, we were like, after the EP is done, we were like, okay, the Japanese guy, he has to play the songs, you know, anyway, on radio. So at least we have something going on there. And then afterwards, we were like, we, were, we, we got a manager. And then our manager was like, yo, guys, um, I've got a couple of uh, deals here. But like I think we should put this this music out ourselves, and just has, keep on hustling. And then we did we did that. We put out the music. We went to uh, we we put it out in a record store in Chicago. We, we put it out on vinyl first. Put it out in Chicago. Put it out in in Texas, LA, uh, Japan, London, and then uh, New York. I don't know if you know other music store in New York, so you put it put it out there. And actually, I for, I forgot something very important about being independent because I know like doing doing whatever that you do and keep w when you keep on doing it is very important because before we 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 released the, the vinyls, we we needed obviously needed the money to print the vinyls. So one day while, uh, while hustling, uh, we were performing at um, Joe's Pub in New York. We performed at Joe's Pub and then comes this guy. After the show, this guy comes up wearing a suit and he was like, yo, guys, when is your next performance? We were like, actually, we're performing tomorrow in Brooklyn. Then he was like, I'm going to come. 
then this guy uh, comes to the Brooklyn show and we announce that, yo guys, we want to release this album. We recorded at the Electric Ladyland, but we're sitting with this album and we want to print, we want to do like a cover, we want to promote the stuff. So this guy, this guy <laughs> came after the, well, we, we, had a, we had a paper bag going around of people like just like putting money in the bag so that we can... Uh, the original crowdfunding. Uh, uh, the original Brown crowdfunding. Brown bag crowdfunding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is before the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after the show, this, this guy in a suit heard us, you know, about the, heard the money story and he came to us and was like, yo guys. And that was, it, it was crazy because it was uh, uh, during the uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton campaign. Right, so this guy comes up to us and is like, yo guys, and we were obviously Obama, you know, America is gonna have a black president, you know, this is crazy. This guy comes up to us and says, yo, I'm the chairperson of the uh, Hillary Clinton Foundation, and, <laughs> and uh, what's your address? I can help you with that money, you know? And, and true, like after two days, we got a check, you know, in the post box where we were staying, and we released the album. I mean, the EP, we released the EP ourselves and kept on doing well. And then we came back home. And then, after And you, when you came back, you had apparently had five or six offers we had from some of the most amazing record labels yeah, on your desk. And then you, you essentially had created a, a bidding war for the signature of, the, of Blackjacks, right? And exactly. That's another whole story. But I mean, it's... Yeah. it's it's an incredible story, so just carry on. <laughs> Independent hustling to Absolutely. doing the groundwork and then yeah. collaborating with the right people and, and not just jumping at the, at the first deal. Exactly. And, and it's hard, eh? It's a, it's a hard, and tough process. Talk, talk about process, co collaborations. Yeah. Like, the first day in New York, uh, we partnered with Puma the first day and till this date. And the first day was like 2007. I think, yeah, until this day, we're still uh, partnering with Puma. Some of, the, my, some of my uh, gear, my studio gear, was bought by Puma. And they've kind of sponsored us, like, since. So that's a shout-out to <laughs> Puma. <laughs> well, I think there's, there's, a, lot of, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of stories of, of musicians who have long-standing partnerships with brands, and it doesn't come from immediately asking for a big check. There's, there's long-standing relationships and collaborating in different forms. I mean, a, a good example, contemporary example, might be somebody called Muzi, um, who is a great musician, uh, producer, and he has a long-standing relationship with a shoe brand. I don't know if we want to mention a competitor shoe brand, but it, it didn't ask for money for a good period of time until it was the right moment within they gave a substantial amount of money and, and, made, that, and made him a global ambassador for the brand. And... That's exciting because that's a, a three, four, five year relationship in the making that is a relationship, it's a collaboration. And it's not just about a paycheck at the end of the day, it's about a relationship with the person. I think, I think brands um, have realized that you know, there's real value in backing artists. I mean, it's, it's, it's always been there. Um, but I think obviously as modern marketing and communication is involved as well. They can extract real value from those kind of partnerships. So for a brand like Puma to be associated still after all these years is, it's, you know, it's a really a shout out to them because they had the vision, they have the foresight. And I mean, I think for a lot of independent artists, you know, or any artist to have those um, associations. I mean, I went, one of the artists I worked with was, was Goldfish. You know, um, back in the day, uh, Mini, you know, Mini South Africa. So identified them as a the right fit for the brand. And to this day, they that was in 2008. You know, so all these these years later, Goldfish now live in, or well, they've moved to the, to the States, you know, to, to further their careers, which is, you know, absolutely great. You know, great opportunities there. Um, but whenever they come back to South Africa, many will provide them with vehicles, and they'll do shows, and you know it works for for everybody, and it saves. It's you know it's a practical 
consideration. They don't have to hire cars when they're back home and touring in South Africa. So, I mean, I think that's a crucial part, and that is a collaboration. That's mm, a, the brand collaboration. It's a pure part. It's a partnership, yeah. yeah. So absolutely vital. <coughs> and and it, I think it's going to become even more important. I mean, the, the post-COVID landscape in South Africa, I think it's 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 going to take a while to get back to what it was in terms of festivals and touring and events. We can see it coming through, and I think things like vaccine passports are unfortunately going to be a, a um, well, fortunately going to be a way that people will be able to get back into touring and gigging again. I mean, I know, you know, Tsipung is, the, you know, the, the new Blackjacks record is, is out. It, it's generating a lot of interest, but you were saying earlier the frustration is that you can't, you can't necessarily reach that, that physical audience, which is so critical to building your career. Like you were talking about those shows in, in New York and you go to Texas and you meet people along the way, these things organically evolve. So, you know, that's, that's something, I mean, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on like the post COVID because it's, it's a huge thing in the industry. We need to talk about it, and navigate it. Yeah, I mean, like we were, we, we had the Black Jacks album ready in, 2000, in 2019 and COVID started uh, in Europe or in, let me just say in the West and we were supposed to do to start a tour then so they told us there's this thing COVID that's coming you know so you can't even because we're going to start releasing the album in Europe you, you can't release the album because we can't tour the album and then when 2020 came the COVID started in South Africa and we were like, but we can't skip another year without releasing the album. So it was the same reason. Like, we can't release the album and then not tour the album because we're a live band. That's how we promote the album, you know, at the show. Like, uh, so Europe works like it doesn't, you don't, you don't just perform in Europe. Like, you, most of the time you, perform, you do the circuits, um, you do the tour circuits when, when you are promoting a certain album. So uh, we had to just release it during COVID because we haven't released that album in 10 years. So it, it was... We were chatting about it earlier. Do you think that social media and the streaming platforms and the, the reach that you have now as a, a, a based, an artist based in South Africa, the global reach and the, the, the scale of that has increased even during a lockdown period. So I, I guess that's one of the silver linings that you are able to still connect. And we were chatting yeah. earlier about some of the I'm a piano artists who you know, that genre has literally is exploding, yeah. taking yeah. over, and they are touring across Europe, despite as, as Europe or other er territories open up and right across the continent as well. So, yeah. so inevitably, that's a little glimpse, I think, into the post-COVID touring landscape. But it, but it, it's such a crucial part of the industry. I mean, it's yeah, just, you have to back it up. So all the promo, all the airplay, all the exposure and the interest, if you can't back it up with, with performance and with touring, yeah. you know, you, you're always gonna, you're gonna battle to compete with, you know, on, on, a, global, on a global level. Yeah. And so I think social media has allowed um, the walls to be broken down in terms of you can be a South African-based artist and reach people in different territories. And I think, as yeah. you were saying earlier, you, you had a song that was up on MySpace and somebody in Japan is knocking on your door. Yeah. That wasn't possible in the pre-internet age. You had to send physical copies of CDs. And I remember yeah. doing that as a, as a kid, bought CDs at Look and Listen or Musica and sent them to friends overseas because I, I was so passionate about South African music. And I think, as Lance was saying, the Amapiano wave, which has taken over the globe, You've got artists like Georgia Smith in the UK trying to cop the Amapiano sound, doing it badly, I might add. But um, <laughs> artists like Kabza and, and Maparisa and Focalistic are really showcasing South Africa and putting us on, on the world stage and are able to tour because they've been vaccinated, they have a vaccination passport, and they, they're putting the, the live performance in front of people. And you can only do that by collaborating, by, yeah. by putting it out there, by making sure that the world sees the music and, and finding the right partners. Exactly. Um, I think 
also like the most important part is is evolving like in terms of how we do things i think this uh, the covid has brought uh, a lot of um uh, techniques on how to how to work in the space in the music industry space like for instance this streaming you know the streaming thing is like i mean it's it, it it's it has been there before covid but now people are getting into it and they understand it better because sometimes you something comes up and then you take uh, you take a while to kind of understand it and and the purpose of it and now we know that streaming is important uh, we can do a show in south africa for the european market or for european people i still i, I still believe that there's something magic about going to a show and being in a room and the sound hitting and the crowd it's this that's the closest form of magic that you can find uh -huh. like real magic is uh -huh. is a proper live performance uh -huh. and as much as a testament to, to live streaming is is a fact of of covid-19 uh -huh. it's not the same yeah no it's, it's exactly not the same uh, because i'm a i'm a i'm a live performer exactly uh, as a I, drummer like i'm a i'm a drummer i'm a live performer so even like i mean i record people in studio i mean i don't even like studio for for myself for for blackjacks or my solo stuff like i like uh, performing that's I, i wish that's what we could do in life i wish that i could just perform the songs even new songs i'll perform a new song today that i just composed on stage that's what i want to do uh, i always used to say or we always used to say in the band that the 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 album the recording is is the menu and the live performance is the, is the actual meal that, that's a that's a notion that's been around since the beginning of recorded music so it's it's totally understandable there is that there's nothing to top that that connection when you feel you can feel the energy of a crowd you know you, if you're part of the crowd but when you're up there and you're performing can you tell us uh, yeah. it's it's, a, it's an amazing thing yeah yeah and so we will be we will get back there and thanks to you know platforms like Basha and people that have remained committed to the live industry and there's i mean it, it's been battered there's there's no way around it the live industry in south africa was probably about a you know all in all about a 15 billion rand industry it was far bigger than the recorded music industry and it literally got flattened overnight and it's going to take a while and you've got to you know there's people that have lost everything they've lost their livelihoods and they've lost they've had to change careers they've had to sell if you you know so this 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 live streaming thing you know people were pivoted and were able to do something around that but you know we can all just i think the message is that you've got to we will get back to that again and i think that what south africa has is a you know a thriving live industry or it, it can be again and find that south africa has an innovative spirit so even within this tumultuous space south african musicians have found innovative ways to collaborate to to make this weird situation work for them so as much as as we're all struggling and as you say it's 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 a very difficult time for for the creative industry as a whole it is also bred innovation so you can use live streaming and you can collaborate with artists across the globe so you could be sitting in south africa and now via a zoom call you could be chatting to an artist in turkey or in in ghana and and working on on collaborations like that and and making new content that you then package in the form of a live stream that you can then sell somewhere else that you can in the eventual kind of 2022 during, during or 2021 covid like last year 2020 i did a show for um national art art festival that we were supposed to go to Grahamstown so we couldn't do the festival again so i did a show um where the keyboard player was in switzerland and the percussionist was in mozambique and then we just did it like that and that that's an innovative way that would never happened before that people would have had to fly here it would have been a whole logistical thing exactly. now we figured out a way to finesse those relationships and i think that's what what flame studios as a space here is also all about i mean you can you can a bit maybe speak to that as as a space of innovation and a, and a, a creative vehicle for 
artists to collaborate, the new generation as well as the old. And I think that's what's really exciting about the space is that Busi Machlacela is here, you've got the Charles Jean suite or the Rams experience who come in and it's, it's different generations of musicians who bump into each other and, and maybe develop something crazy and exciting. Well, I think that's what I've got to, you know, the studio is, we built it during lockdown. So again, it's not all, you know, doom and gloom. We were able to still build this incredible facility at Con Hill. And I think it's, Constitution Hill has always been a place, it's a, it, it's a neutral space where people come together organically and play. It's, it's, it's a crossroads of, of different genres, different, you know, different everything. But it's, it's got this, um, it's almost a sacred space in many ways, given the history of what's happened at Constitution Hill. It's obviously now the home of the Constitutional Court but the precinct is an incredible precinct. And we, I'm just personally privileged to be able to have built this um, incredible facility and to be, you know, the, one of the most exciting things about it is that we get to, I get to collaborate with Zipang again. Uh, we've, had, we've had a few over the years, but and we'll talk about those shows, but um, you know, we've got, we, we share spirit here which is you know to rec have a space where people can come together and record but we also have a space here at Con Hill where people can perform so it's not just about the recording process but we can actually showcase those works as well so it's a very very exciting time and I'm you know I'm really looking forward to that and, and so yeah again it's, it, it talks to um, a very unique space it's not just unique um, in South Africa, it's unique globally. I mean, there are not many places in the world where you have studios built into the walls of, you know, an old fort. Slash prison. <laughs> and, and then, you know, Tsepang's space is incredible. He's, his space is an, it's an old nursing home, you know, and to bring all those different, you know, those talks to the history of the place. And what we're trying to do is reimagine and and almost rewrite history through music and collaboration. And, uh, you know, Tepang was talking about it earlier, is that the, and the music that, the collaborations that we create, we're not, we as a studio, we're not trying to own those. We're not trying to start a record label and own the artist. And we are just merely providing a, a platform where they can come together and they can create. And then the ownership rests then with, with the artist which is a very important thing. And I think that's a very unique and it's quite a rare thing. You know, in, in the modern era, people, everybody wants to buy something or own something or build an empire or, but we, Constitution Hill almost, it kind of, it has a different feel to it. So I'm just very, very excited about the work that we're gonna do together and you know, we'll, we'll keep everybody posted, but you know, platforms also like Basha and these things where we come together, we talk, it's invaluable because it always leads to something. You come together, you collaborate, it will always lead to something now. So yeah. Work breeds more work. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what part of the whole ethos of, of what we do of, of our, as arbiters of culture is, is putting in the work. I mean, I'm sure we, we spoke about this earlier, but when we were coming up and I used to travel around the country with a band that I really liked and I didn't, I got into a car and drove around the country and said, I don't care if you pay me or not, I just want to help set up the sound system and set up the drums and, and, and that's doing the work, doing the lead work, the groundwork and, and off the back of that, we've built up networks, we've collaborated with people that we've, I would have never dreamed of. I've traveled the world, as, as I'm sure you guys have as well, using music and, and connections and, and collaborations as a vehicle to do to realize my dreams. Yeah, um, it's, it's the great thing is that I have traveled the world doing something that I, I love, like, and something that I know really well. I mean, when I was young, I was, I was telling a friend of mine today that I was a rapper and I, I did this and I didn't want to do anything that I wasn't uh, good at or that I didn't think I was the best at, you know, so I mean, when I play, I, I've, I mean, I've played keys, I've played everything, and when I played drums, I thought, oh, maybe this, this is it. And I traveled the world doing that, and that's it's, it's 
very important. Uh, the other day, I, I, I posted on, 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 on Facebook that um, my talent is, is my, my income is my talent. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's very close to me. That and, and that's the only thing I do. I mean, I'm, I'm in the music industry. It's not that I'm, I have another, like, side business, hustle or something. Business, driving a truck or something. But yeah, no. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, I don't know if we've got time, but I mean, how, I mean, how did you gravitate to the drums? I mean, that's a, <laughs> can you share that story or is it, uh, is um, it personal or is it, it's just, I no, mean, no, you are really, an incredible yeah. drummer and that, that's a, you know, that's something that a lot of kids maybe, you know, yeah. these days, they might not even look at that. I mean, I don't know a lot of kids that are learning the drums, right? Yeah. Any instrument for that matter. I think, I think, anyway, let's, I don't want to speak for you, but I mean, no. tell us a bit about um, your history. When I was in high school, I, I, like I went to a lot of high schools. Uh, yeah, I was that, that guy. Like I was dismissed a lot. So I went to a school called Holy Family. It's like uh, here by, just, just before Rosebank there. So I went to high school there, and then it didn't work out. I went to Westridge, which is in the west. It didn't work out. And then my parents decided to take me to, to Tlaxstop, like northwest. And that's where I discovered that I like music. Uh, there was, I, don't, I don't really like church much. Like I, actually, I kind of hate it. So <laughs> anyway. Uh, there was there was a church there, so I had to go. It was compulsory for me to go to church. So they were playing all these instruments, and I always because I'm there by force, like I like I I was rebelling against it. But I always saw people playing instruments, and I was like, I thought I could, uh, you know, I could do that. So I always used to emulate playing drums, and even going back home when a song plays, out, you know, emulate it and because I, I see what they're doing. I'm like, okay, maybe I can do this. And then when I got uh, dismissed there at the boarding school, I went, to, I went back to Holy Family and they took me back. So, um, okay, Holy Family, I was in detention. So, because I was always in detention, I didn't, like they told me not to check the, the list uh, of, of the students that go to detention. I must just go every Friday. So, but then. <laughs> yeah. So I went to detention. So this this one day, uh, the guy that took the teacher that took detention was was absent. So they were like, all the deten the, all the people that are in detention should go to the contemporary music uh, class, and it's like huge. So you know, would fit in the corner and would write, I must, I must not, I must not. <laughs> so now, these guys are playing. The students are playing. Like you know. They're actually playing uh, Carlos Santana, and I was like, "Yo, this, this, this is this close to my thing. It's, it's not really my thing." Because at the time, obviously, I was into like Radiohead and you know Smashing Pumpkins and stuff like that, uh, Stimela, Shumasigela. So they were playing Santana, and I was like, "Yo, that's dope." And they had a drum kit, but. Uh, th there was no drama, and they had the whole band playing. And then I was actually trying to be funny, like going to the drums. I went to the drums, and then I started playing, because, you know, I used to emulate those. And I played, I actually played right. And the headmaster, the headmaster takes the, was taking the class. So the headmaster was like, yo, dude, you are off detention. From now on, you are here. You worked <laughs> your way out of detention. <laughs> exactly. So two years I was playing with the band at school. And then after that, when I finished school, I went to study sound engineering. Uh, I finished sound engineering and then I went to study music. Uh, I went to study uh, piano, jazz piano. When I got there, I changed jazz piano to drums. And then I finished the music school and then I went to TUT to further my studies to get a degree for music. And then I kind of, did I, no, I didn't quit. I, I, I had to... You had a young hiatus. Yeah, I, I had to leave because we were going on tour, actually. So 
you touched on something interesting is that the, your musical taste was so divergent from Huma Sekela to Radiohead. Yeah. I mean, you, you spoke earlier when we were speaking outside about the the type of music. So you, you put on a show in, in Soweto at, at a venue called The Pelican. Yeah, yeah. I mean, tell us about that collaboration, because that was bringing together a variety of, of genres and collaborating with people who might not necessarily be au fait with a space like Soweto, who, uh -huh. if there's a white rock band, who were afraid to kind of travel because they didn't know where to go. Yeah. Bringing them into a space like that. What was that dynamic like, that collaboration? How did that happen? Like, I really think, I've always thought, like, like I listen to everything, like hip-hop, uh, jazz, kwaito, my piano, whatever. I listen to as long as the song is... Is, is is cool, so I go to I'm I am i am from Soweto, and when I'm when I'm in Soweto, I gel with with everybody like that's in the hood. Uh, if it, when I go to Gandhi Square uh, and go hang out with the hip hop heads, I I still gel in, and then when I go to school and meet up with the guys from the north, I I still gel, and when I go to uh, Melville the Bohemian. I still gel with everybody, so I, I thought if you bring everybody together, you have. I think that's how 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 the easiest way to get audience, because if if I bring the Kwaito guys or the house guys in in, in from the hood to play this show, so there, there are guys called the house cats. I don't know if you know them. House cats, yeah. Yes, exactly. So that show, the house cats were there as well. Um, I just remembered because I don't remember the bands that that performed. Moonchild was there. Uh, Black Jacks was performing. Um, I forgot the other bands, um, but it was different kind of bands. Like there was house, there was rock, there was alternative, there was Kwaito, there was like everything, and the the house cats brought audience from the hood. And blackjacks brought audience from kind of like pieces and bits, and then the other band brought uh, like your greens. I think th they were from Linden, or you know, they brought their guys. And then the other band was like a very hard rock band, so they brought the you know the headbangers <laughs> you know, in Soweto. But I it's exciting. It's, it's exposing to people something that they might not know, and, and you don't know what you don't know until exactly. you're exposed to and it. Until, until you see it. So yeah. you, you might not know that you're a classical music fan until you go and you watch a classical well, music concert. So exactly. that, that's what's exciting to me about a platform like that, but you creating a platform like that is showcasing various genres to people who might not be exposed to it in their own right, and then them making the choice from in their own way to say, I like this, I don't like this, and keep yeah. it moving from there. But they need to be exposed to it, and I think so much so that you you had politicians come to you after the gig and and yeah, uh, want to do something bigger out of yeah, the back of it. They, they wanted to do something bigger. Uh, most most importantly, actually, Basha Uvur uh, kind of uh, kind of does that as well now because there's like your your hip hop your hip hop guy. I remember we performed Basha Uvur and we performed right after Pro Kid. So you see, it's rest like in peace. Uh, Rest in peace. I actually had a, an opportunity to work with the with the man. Yeah. So, Pasha Uhuru, like there was, like rock bands. There were alternative bands. There were there was hip hop, uh, as I said, um, Pro Kid, uh, Questa was there. Uh, I don't remember the other artists, but it was like it's it, Pasha Uhuru is kind of that kind of festival. Yeah, you you can together. speak to the kind of the the diversity and the. The multitude of people that come to to Basha and and how that ne the, the collaboration between a brand like like Nando's who who obviously are one of the sponsors a space like Constitution Hill the curation by by Ken Zero comes together to make this this event happen. Yeah, it's a unique it's a unique festival, and I think shout out to Kenny. You know, Ken Zero has been an integral part of the music programming for for many years, and I've been fortunate enough to to work with him. Wearing a Nando's hat, Nando's is the headline sponsor, and for them, as a brand, it's a showcase of creativity. They can showcase um, the visual art elements, the design elements, and, and some of the music elements. Um, but again, it's it's almost um, it's a unique event to Constitution Hill. I think 
constitution it gives you that freedom. It's always been that again, that neutral space, a meeting space where people can come together and feel safe and feel that they can express themselves. And, you know, it's not, it's not really anything to do with the Constitution. I mean, it's Constitution Hill. So I think <laughs> what, we can, what we can all try and do is to share that messaging a bit more because it ultimately that, that right to come together and to perform and express yourself through music and through the arts and through the creative industries was something that was it was foreign to me growing up in the era that I did. I mean, I'm an OG, like you said. I'm, I missed out on a lot of that. And that's something that we must never forget. I think that, you know, Tsipang was talking, you know, the power to bring different genres together, different people, is it's a very special thing. And in South Africa, uh, I think it has extra meaning, given our history. And I must never forget that, you know, the right to do that was is enshrined in the Constitution. We can forget that quite easily. So I think Bashahura has a special um, appeal, and it's it's silos of, of different genres of different it's gender an lines, of, yeah, of creativity of different genres, and it's always, and that's a glimpse for me of what it should be like for the rest of. And it does happen, it does translate, but I think, you know, it comes from the, when it comes from the hill, it carries a, an extra resonance as well, and I think people, they like that as well. Um, Agreed. I don't think it's, I it's, it's also just a really great party, you know, it's like people, I think post-COVID, are going to want to express themselves, and dance and music and coming together is a, it's an incredible way to to express that and to share those freedoms that we have. And, and Russia has always been about the youth and the next generation and giving that platform to, you know, you guys had that platform early on in your career. So, yeah, so I would just encourage everybody to end of November, sorry, end of October, the last yeah. weekend of October, get just come through and the tickets are, there's going to be limited availability. So I think it's important to, to get, put that in the diary. But again, you know, you don't have to, wait for Basha to come to Constitution Hill. There's a lot of exciting things happening at Con Hill. The studios the project is just one of it, but they're new spaces and, and there's a there's a movement, there's a creative uprising that's that's going on and it's you know, it's an open invitation for people to just come and experience it. You don't have to wait for a festival. No, it's, and, and you have the, the luxury of being anywhere in the world now, being a hybrid festival like Sipang was saying earlier we've learned to adapt live streaming to be part of the live space. So now you could be in Sweden and be watching Basha Uhuru in Sweden in the comfort of your own home. The next year you, you can come. And once you've got your passport. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Yep. Cool. I think, uh, I'm not sure what, what are time is. Or if there are any questions. Are there any questions in the room? Nothing? There's one. Do you want to come through this side? And I think you can grab the mic from Lance. Uh, yeah, if you want, jumping over there. Uh, thank Take you, guys. My, um, my name is Roderick. I'm an artist manager. So um, I have a question regarding um, collaborations. Do you advise um, artists to pay for a collaboration with an artist? And the other question that I have is um, regarding the brands. How do they, what, what do they benefit from, a, um, from an artist and how do you approach a brand? What is, is, what is it that they're actually looking for when they want to collaborate with the artist? Thank you. So Tapang, I think you can the, the collaboration between artists and paying for collaborations. Yeah, I mean, I used to, there's a, a hip hop artist I used to work with, and every time he wanted to collaborate with somebody, they were like they wanted a fee. And for for me personally, I I don't take that as a co collaboration, and I have never done that before. Uh, it's a collaboration for me. It's it's it has to be. Um, I think Lance we spoke about it earlier. We we have to gel. We have to like I mean paying for it. I mean how are we gonna how is that going to happen? I mean, it's, 
it's the same as I could just record the song at home and then send it to you, <laughs> and then you record and then collaboration. It's not a really a true collaboration. Yeah, like I'm. I, I think, uh, like you, you know, a good example, Mrenal Raba. Mrenal Raba has been collaborating almost every song. Uh, collaborates with with people, producers, different people, all the time, and that's taking him like very far. And I think you know. if if it comes to money, for me, in my experience in the music industry, it's not necessarily a money upfront thing. If there's a proper collaboration, and yes, money will come from such a collaboration, it's defining the nature of what those splits are once the, m the song takes off or the project takes off. I mean, like you say, predominantly hip-hop artists do that where they, yeah, yeah. Where they demand a, a certain fee for a feature. Yeah, and, and, and then another thing, like hip-hop artists are always, I, th I, th I think f maybe it's the culture. One hip-hop artist told me it's the culture, you know, but some one would say they charge but they don't charge and then when we get into the studio we've had i won't mention names but we've had that kind of situation where we approach an artist and then they're in the studio and they were supposed to be charging and then they tell you that yo don't tell anybody that we, we're doing it for free and you just just tell them you ch i charged you twenty thousand so because <laughs> that's the nature of relationships <laughs> yeah you're building the relationships yeah. in a network yeah, yeah exactly and the energies are also different so if you give you paying somebody there's an expectation of a deliverable thank you for that one um and then the one of the brands what are they looking for when do you approach them as an artist or you wait for them to come to you okay, that's a lance i can talk to that well in in my experience it, it works both ways i think um i was saying earlier that brands are and agencies are actively looking to change the way that they market to their audience or they position their brand. So music is seen as a cool way to reposition in many, especially if you're thinking of alcohol brands or clothing brands or, you know. Um, so, so often they will keep, they'll have somebody at an agency or, you know, at the company who keeps an eye out on, you know, the scene or what's going on and will approach artists. Um, so I think that that's definitely, you know, probably the most, pr the predominant way it happens. But then, you know, obviously if, you've, if you're an artist and you've got a, a, a manager who's clued up about what brand might be a good fit, you know, then you make proposals and you, you identify the brand. It's normally, I, I would say, it's based on a, on a need sometimes. You know, if you're a, a group that you're starting out or you want to go touring, you're going to need a vehicle to hit the road, right? So in my day, <laughs> I've, spent, I've spent many, many hours approaching vehicle brands for sponsorship of a, of a van, you know, whether it's a Combi or a Merc, whatever, or a Hyundai, or, a, you know, you you would identify. So it kind of works both ways. I think that's something to note. It's not every proposal that you write is going to be a yes. Yeah. The target market is very, like, important and sometimes brands are looking to do something like uh, like we were talking about Rudy area like he looks for like w there's a market that we need to tap into so what's going to help us tap into that to that market because sometimes it's like if you want to tap into the alternative scene most alternative people don't really watch TV so how are you going to uh, uh, promote your brand or advertise your brand because you, you're not going to watch on TV so uh, Dickies is a very good example of it because they wanted to go to a more uh, urban type uh, because Dickies used to be like a Kasi yeah. exactly so I think target to know the target market and then as Lance was saying like your, your man the manager has to be good enough and knows how to pro how to propose to that uh, right a brand like on target market why are you uh, why are you the one for that brand that's something we were speaking about earlier as well is, is knowing what leverage you have as an artist because you have a fan base you've got an audience and it's about going cool this is the data set that i have so you know that it's not just like x amount of followers on facebook it's like this is the, the do a deep dive into the back end of your of your audience and understand i have this many men this many women this is the cities that they're in get their details because those brands also want to get that database 
you have that market. They they might be a cool brand, but they don't have access to market which you do as a musician. People look to you. Then like they know about the car brands, but they're looking at you. They're actively engaging with the artist. Sure. Anyone else? I think that uh, concludes our little panel discussion. Yeah, a wrap on our discussion on um, collaboration and independence in the music industry. Yep. Um, thank you to Basha Uhuru and the thank Creative you. Conference. Thank, thank you to you. Lance. Thank you to Zipan. Thank you to you guys. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on this with and you. And come to Basha. Yeah, <laughs> come to Basha. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>